Uh, as you all got up this morning, um, thankfully all of you got dressed. You put on clothes that you are either happy with or maybe not, uh, and you have decided to come and gather with the church community in worshiping our Lord uh, clothed with, with things that you're not afraid to be around in. I talked about a few weeks ago that there are times where uh, if you are out working in the fields and doing other things that might cause you to be smelly and dirty, uh, for the sake of the people around you, when you're done with that, you will take those clothes off, get cleaned up, and you will put on new clothes that are nice and not smelly and not dirty around the people around you so that they can also enjoy your company. And, and the idea that I was making with that illustration was to say that a lot of times in our lives we think that what we do in private or what we do that nobody else is really aware of, or maybe that people are aware of, that we think that what we do doesn't have an effect on the people around us. As long as I'm doing what I want to do in private, it does not affect anybody around us. But, but what God's Word declares to us is that for the sake of the community, for the sake of the people around us, in particular, as Paul's writing to a church, for the church, putting off our sin is essential for the church community. If we do not put off our sin, it is like walking into a sanctuary after having, walked, after having worked in the hog confines. We bring that into the church community, and that will have an effect on us. Well, this morning we're going to look at what needs to happen after we've taken off and rid ourselves of the sin. And so if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to open it up to Colossians chapter 3. We are going to be looking at verses 12 to 14 this morning. Colossians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles in the pew back in front of you. You can grab one of those and turn to page 984. I would love for you to have a Bible in front of you where you can see what God's Word is declaring to us this morning. And as we do each week, if you are able, would you please stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 12. Paul says this, Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> so we've taken a few weeks off from our journey through the book of Colossians. And so I want to pick, uh, bring us back up to speed. We, we stopped on uh, Easter and, and dealt with something else on Easter. And then uh, the last two Sundays, we've been talking about our new vision for the church, where we believe that the Lord is taking us in the next five years. And so now we are coming back to the book of Colossians that we started at in the beginning of the year. And as a reminder, I've said each week in our study of the book of Colossians is that Paul is writing this to the church in Colossae, it's a church that he has never met before. Uh, they've never seen each other face to face. The people in Colossae are a people that are in an insignificant town, not too unlike Washington, Iowa. And, and Paul is writing to them and, and encouraging them, wanting them to be complete in Christ. And completeness in Christ looks like maturity, and knowing God's will for them. And as he's writing this letter to this church, he's writing this because false teachers have come into the church and are telling the people there and trying to persuade them that completeness and maturity and knowing God's will, the way that you will become filled in that completeness is by adding on a lot of other things that they deem are necessary to be full, to be complete, to be mature. Things that, like things that they should put away, that they're maybe practicing in their life, that other false teachers are saying, no, you need to stop doing those things. Or 
adding in rituals and practices that God said are not necessary. And the way that Paul is combating these false teachers is by saying, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. He is complete. He is what you need to be full and to be complete in Christ. And and if Jesus is not complete, if we need to add things on to Jesus to be complete in our salvation, then we're saying Jesus isn't enough. And Paul's saying that's the problem. Jesus is enough. And so he begins by saying this, and then he continues to go on and say that their identity in Christ as followers of Jesus is secure. They, they, they don't need to worry about falling away, that they are complete and secure in Christ, and the Lord will work in them to produce fruit. The Christian is secure in Christ, not because of following regulations or rules or do this or don't do that. The Christian is mature and secure in Christ because Jesus is enough, because he has provided all that is needed. And lastly, all of these truths are in the context of the church community. We have been brought together to live out our faith, our identity as a Christian together in obedience to Christ and in unity. We get to do these things together, church. So this is what completeness looks like. And in the previous two paragraphs in Colossians chapter 3, Paul has communicated two important truths leading up to what I just read this morning. And the first is this, seek things above. Or to go along with our vision, lift up your eyes to God. Put them on Him. And second, Put sin to death and live in Christ. These are the commands that he is giving to them. So lift up your eyes, put sin to death. And like any good four-year-old, you might be saying, well, why? why? Why should I do these things? Well, because in part, we are bound together in love. We are bound together in love. And Paul begins verse 12 really by telling us, remember who you are. Remember who you are. If we look at verse 5 and then verse 12, we see that Paul wants us to put off or put to death sin, and he wants us to instead put on characteristics and attributes that are essential for community. But before he does that, he starts by telling us, remember who you are. Remember your identity. See, we're, we're apt as people to want to follow, maybe, sometimes, rules and commands. We we will have the attitude or mentality, just tell me what to do, and I'll take care of that. But Paul in in this letter is saying, before he gets to the commands, remember who you are. He never gives us commands to follow before telling us who we are in Christ. That's essential. If we get that out of order, we think, well, I've got to do something to make God love me. And the reality is, God loves you, and as a response to his love for us, we get to follow after him and obey him in community. And so, Paul says, this is who you are. Who are we? What does the text say? Three things. We are chosen, we are holy, and we are beloved. If you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, if you recognize I am a sinner far from God, I have separated myself from him, if you understand that and recognize that and then repent and turn from your sin and trust that the only way for me to be made clean is by trusting only in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus to unite me to God, then the text tells us if you believe that, You are chosen, you are holy, you are beloved. That is your identity. That is how God views you. 
which, by the way, are the same words that God used to describe the people of Israel in the Old Testament and are the same words that describe Jesus. Chosen, holy, beloved. So, let's deal with those three things. First, chosen. Now, I am, in my beliefs and in my understanding of the Bible, I am reformed in my theological persuasion. Some of you hearing that have no idea what I just said, and that's okay. But if you stick around Faith Baptist Church for any length of time, you will hear me talk about, as I unpack God's Word, that God is sovereign, and He's in control, and that God saves people for Himself. One of, one of the items that I believe that the Bible is very clear on are those things, that He is sovereign, God is good, and He is divine in His will. He has chosen for Himself a people that He adopts and make them His children for His glory. This is what He does. And here's what's amazing about this. If you've, if you've repented of your sins, if you've trusted Jesus that I just talked about, that he's done the work for you, then before you ever believed, before you ever understood that you needed to repent, before you ever trusted Jesus, God chose you for himself. And if that's you this morning, if you have trusted Christ and you hear that God chose you, the right response to that statement should be, why in the world would he choose me? Why me? Why should I receive this grace? If we say, well, I know why he chose me. He chose me because he knew that I would choose him. And if we have that mentality, that thought, then the reality of that thinking is that, well, then God has responded to my choosing. Now there is something in me that God is responding to, to choose me. And I don't believe that's what God's Word is saying. God is always the initiator. For those of us in Christ who are chosen in Him, we are chosen by God before He created anything and everything. This past weekend, some of you were maybe glued to your TVs because it was the NFL draft. Some of you could care less. But here's what's fascinating about the NFL draft. That mostly 21, 22, and 23-year-old young men in their peak physical condition are chosen by a bunch of overweight rich guys to make their overpriced teams in elaborate billion-dollar stadiums just a little bit better. They were chosen. Why? Because they have proved themselves on the athletic field to be better than others. And these rich billionaires are choosing these young men hoping to make more money. Sure, to provide a little bit of entertainment for the rest of us. But their desire is to just make a bunch of money. That's why they're choosing them. They see something in these young men to make their teams better. But that's not how God chooses. It's the exact opposite. God chooses out of love. God chose you if you're in Christ. He set his affection upon you. That's amazing. And so identity, our identity, if we're in Christ, is chosen by God. That's who you are, chosen by God. The God of the universe chose you. It's amazing. I could go on, but we're going to keep moving. Our second identity that we see is tied to this being chosen is that we are holy. Holy. For simplicity's sakes, so there's two ways to think about holiness. One is that there is right conduct, perfect conduct, doing what is always right. Another part of holiness is being set apart. The holy in verse 12 is the latter 
item, being set apart. When we are chosen, we are then set apart as God's own children. We are set apart for the, from those who are not His. We're other, we're different. And now, yes, we are united to Christ. We are given His perfection. We, we are seen as holy and perfectly obedient by God because of Christ's perfection for us. But here, Paul is focusing on God setting us apart. Setting us apart unto him. Isaiah 43 says this, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I've set you apart. You're mine. We are set apart unto him. And the last identity that we see is that we are beloved. God didn't choose us to then set us apart only to then set us aside. He loves us. He lavishes his love on those who are his. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Same word. He calls us the same that he calls Jesus, beloved. The great love the Father has for His Son, the Father has for those who are chosen and set apart in Him. And here's what's so amazing. God knows everything about us. He knows how many hairs are on our head, and He knows the thoughts in our head. He knows and sees what we do with, that we do that everybody sees. And he sees what we do when we are all by ourselves. He, he knows the words that we say when we say them with the persons that we deeply love. And he knows the words that we say when we're just kicking it back with our friends and not really guarding our tongue. All those things. He knows every detail about us. And he calls us beloved. Beloved for those of us in Christ. We are bound together in this love. Paul goes on to say then, because this is the reality, because of who you are, and because of what I've brought you into, put on essential attributes for the community. So here are now the commands. Put on these things that I have made of you, and and for you to live out. This is what he desires us to do. We, We don't earn God's favor by doing these things. He already loves us. He's already called us. He's already made us holy. He says, this is, this is what we get to go now and do in the community. And specifically, Paul is talking to the church community. And so, For those of us who would call Faith Baptist Church our regular church home, this is what he wants us to live out in our church community. And if you're here this morning and you regularly attend another church, then he's saying to you this morning, this is what you're to live out in the church community that you are connected with. He desires the people who are reading this letter to live consistently with the spiritual realities that are already true in them. This is who you are. It seems as if Paul is responding particularly to verse 8, where he talks about five different vices, and now in verse 12, he's talking about five different virtues to put on. So if you've taken off your dirty clothes from working in the hog confines, and you've cleaned yourself up, you've put off the dirt of anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk, now put on the clean-smelling clothes of compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Live out together this God-given, God-reflecting attributes that are listed here. These are attributes of God that we see in Jesus and we see in people united to Jesus. We are called to live as he has lived and to walk as he has walked. In the context of community now, so these five items real quickly, First, we are to have compassionate hearts. If we were to literally translate these words in the Greek, we would literally translate them to have bowels of mercy. (laughs) 
Thankfully, they translated compassionate hearts for us. The bowels of mercy, the bowels were considered the seat of the emotions in the ancient Near East. And so Paul is urging to the core of who we are to express compassion, to express mercy. Compassion and mercy have fallen a bit on hard times in our culture in this day and age. We want, we want people to get what they deserve, right? We, we, we want people to, to not get what they don't deserve. We, we don't want to try and understand somebody. We don't want to try and have compassion on mercy for somebody. We want to just cancel people and put them out to pasture. That's, that's not the way it is to be in the church and as we go out from the church. The household of faith is to interact with the world in right ways. We, we, don't, we don't interact with the world with the world's tactics. Many of those are just sinful. We live out with one another compassionate hearts. With one, that's what we do. Second, we are to be kind. I love to tease and to joke around. I love to be in some situations sarcastic. But when people think of me, is the first thing they think about a tease and a joker, a sarcastic person, or do they think of me as kind? We, we don't build a thriving, good, loving faith community by sarcasm and harshness and cruelty. Paul says in Romans, God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. When we sin, he is kind. He is welcoming us to come to him with open arms. He's cheering us toward himself. That's his kindness. Kindness draws people into one another. Third, we are, as God's chosen and holy beloved, we are to put on humility. Paul is saying pride has no place in the community of faith. Pride shames. Pride is selfish. Pride lifts oneself up by bringing others down. Jesus shows us the way. Jesus humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant. When, we, when he came, he was fully God. He took on flesh. He became fully man. And Jesus is still fully God and fully man. For God to take on flesh, to take on what he created, is the most humbling thing imaginable for him to do. But he didn't just take on human flesh, he served. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Might we too be defined in this community as a people who are humble with one another. Fourth, we are to be meek. This is gentleness in attitude and gentleness in behavior. What I find fascinating about Paul's talk about humility and meekness is that those two Greek words are very close to the Greek words that is used in Matthew's gospel in Matthew eleven twenty-nine, 29, where he tells us that Jesus is gentle and lowly. Jesus is meek and humble. These are the defining characteristics of who he is, and so it is the defining characteristics of who we are to be, gentle and lowly, meek and humble approachable, accessible. We represent Christ when we live out, our, live out our identity in Christ of being meek and gentle. And finally, patience. Don't you, don't you see the word patience and think, ah, oh, man, anything but patience. Right? We, we so want people to be patient with us, don't we? Don't we just long for patience when we mess up? And yet it's so difficult for us to be patience, patient with others. The Lord is patient with us. That, that's probably one of the, that characteristic of who God is, is probably the characteristic that I have been most drawn to over the last five years. The Lord is patient. So I can be too. With myself, with others. And he's patient. He continues to give us patience. When I said finally, with patience, Paul actually doesn't stop with patience. He continues on with two more attributes when it comes to the community of faith in verse 13. First, bearing with one another. 
Talk about the practical application of patience. It's bearing with one another. All of us have to bear with others. That's the reality of living in a sin-filled world. There will be people we connect with, and there will be people that we have to bear with, right? And the people that we don't connect with or that we differ from, particularly in the church of Jesus Christ, we don't avoid them, we bear with them. We bear with them. We're together. A church with people who are only the same will not be able to live this out. Our situations are different, and sometimes our different situations bring about difficulties in the church. And so as we interact with people that we might not fully align with, we get to bear with them. I, I have to bear with somebody in this church. Now, it's probably not you. There, I don't think they're actually here this morning. So like, but I'm going to, like, I have to bear with somebody in this church. And his name is Dr. Matt Prohoda. I'd be like, what? <laughs> you got to bear with him? Like, he's amazing. I know, he is. But in the fall, almost every Sunday, he walks around this church in a quarter zip that says Chicago Bears on it. <laughs> That's like the worst. I have to bear with seeing that and him cheering that team on. And of course, this is frivolous. But you get it, right? There are people in our midst that we can divide with, divide from, because of the differences, or we can bear with them. We can bear with them. We can love them. But Paul doesn't stop with just bearing with others. He goes on and discusses the necessity of not only bearing with one another, but forgiving one another. Let's lean into this for a moment. Forgiveness. Like patience, forgiveness is something that we deeply need and want and hope for, but also difficult to provide to others. Just consider the parable that Jesus told in Matthew 18. Peter asks Jesus, how many times am I to forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus responds, depending on your translation of the Bible, Jesus responds either with, no, Peter, 77 times or 70 times seven. Peter thinks he's doing like a miraculous thing, an amazing, look at me, I've, I've forgiven my brother seven times. And Jesus goes, no, 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 no. 77 times, Peter. And he goes on to tell a parable of a man who, pay, who owed an unpayable debt to a king, a servant of that king. And the servant recognizes this unpayable debt and he goes before the king and he pleads with mercy to give him more time to pay back this debt. And the king forgives the debt. He, he doesn't just like give him more time. He, he removes it. Well, this servant goes away and finds another servant who owes him money. And, he's, and he, he demands, and the, the amount of money that the, the other servant owes this one is, is just nowhere near what the, the other servant owes the king. And he goes and he demands repayment. And the servant likewise pleads for mercy, pleads for patience, pleads for time. And instead, the servant throws him in prison. The people around find out about what happens and they go and report it to the king. And the king is understandably furious. Calls the servant in and basically says, I forgave you. And you, you cannot extend forgiveness to your fellow servant. This is what you are called to do. This is what we are called to do. The illustration, the parable is obvious. Our debt to God 
cannot be ever repaid by any one of us. If we have the idea and think, thinking that if my good outweighs my bad, then I'm going to be fine on judgment day. And Jesus in this parable is saying, the debt is unpayable. You cannot repay it. The only way for the debt to be removed is for it to be completely forgiven by God. And that is what he's done for us in Christ. And so, church, we are the servants and we must forgive. That doesn't mean that it will be easy. And what I'm not saying is that if there is sin that has been committed against you, that it is less and it's not significant. Many of you have suffered deeply at the hands of other people. But God in His grace and in His goodness is calling us to forgive. It doesn't mean that there won't be consequences. It doesn't mean that, well, I just forgive and forget and go on as if nothing ever happened. No, we, we continue to protect ourselves and not put ourselves into horrible and dangerous situations. But for the body of Christ, for the church of Jesus Christ, because we are bound together in love, we are to forgive. So much more could be said about forgiveness. That's for another day. But this is what, our call, what we are called to in the community of faith, to help one another be bound together in love. And that's how he ends in verse 14. Put on love which unites us. Verse 14 ends this section by saying, all you need is love. Boop, boop. It doesn't say that. Um, and that little ditty's not there. But, but it, the idea is there of, of all you need is love. Now, there's this question about what love is binding together. What, what is this love that is binding together? Is, is the love binding together the attributes of uh, verses 12 and 13? Or is love binding the church together into perfect unity? Good, good theologians are split on this. I, I would tend to go with the latter. Love binds us together into a local community of faith so that we are together unified. The attributes in 12 to 13 contribute to our love for one another. Church, our love for one another will grow if we are bound together in love by bearing with one another, forgiving one another, having compassion hearts, all these things that we've just talked about. My, my hope, one of my hopes, and one of my goals for this church is that we would elevate our commitment to the church, that we would, that we would see and understand that there is a necessity for us to be together, that there is a, a necessity. I need to come to the church gathering on Sunday morning because I need not only to worship God, but I need the people in these pews. I need them desperately. And it's not just Sunday morning. It's as we go from here. Do we, do we need one another? My, my goal and hope is that we would raise up this commitment to church. And my motive is not to make a name for myself or to make a name for Faith Baptist Church. My, my motive isn't to be able to go out into the community and look, look at how great Faith Baptist is. The reason I want us to see the significance of the church to increase our commitment to the church of Jesus Christ is because Jesus loves the church. He loves us. We are his bride. Yesterday we had a beautiful wedding and married off Emily and Preston Landau. They, you, you could see the love that they had for one another in that, at that wedding. Jesus' love for his bride, the church, is a billion times more. And when we are together, when we are displaying the attributes of verses 12 to 13 and when we are loving each other with the love of Christ, we will be unified. He promises it. Jesus, in, in Jesus' 
last prayer that we see in John 17, he prays for us. He prays to the Father and he says in John 17 that they, that the church, the future church, may become perfectly one. This is what he desires for us, perfectly one, so that the world may know that, Father, you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Do you see the significance of what Jesus is praying? He is saying that our unified love for one another in the community of faith will show the world out there that the Father loves the Son. Is that not amazing? Is that not a responsibility? That's a weighty responsibility that we have. But this is what he prayed for us for. Church, we are bound together in love. And for that reality to hit us, we must remember that we are chosen, that we are holy, that we are beloved. And so my encouragement, if you are here this morning and you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, rest in your identity. This is who you are. Second, because we are His, He has enabled us by His Holy Spirit to live out the attributes of compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. He has enabled us. He enables us by the power of His Holy Spirit to bear with one another, to forgive one another. And I want to encourage you, look at that list that is listed in verses 12 and 13 and 14. And start praying through those things and start pleading and asking the Lord to help you live these out in the community of faith. And finally, put on love. Clothe yourself in love. Love his church by loving the people of his church. For in so doing, not only will our eyes be lifted up to see him and to see others around us who need that love, but we will right now remember that we are his children. And we will see the people around us who aren't. And he's calling us to lift our eyes up so that they would see him and see a community of faith that is bound together in love for his glory and for our good, for the good of those around us. Lord, do so.